Hi, I'm Sam, and this is Sam Says. Today, I'm here to tell you about a brand new game coming to Kickstarter from Eagle Griffin Games called This is Only a Test. This is only a test to set a 1950s middle America where everybody is terrified about what is going to happen with the future of our world. Are the Russians going to invade the United States? Are the Russians going to drop the atomic bomb? Or was this all only a test and nothing is going to happen at all? The only way to find out is to play this game. So let's talk about it. This is only a test plays up to four players and the game can end in one of three different ways. If the atomic bomb drops and everybody has to scurry for their fallout shelters, the person with the most points in consumable items wins the game. If the game ends with the Russians invading the United States, the person with the most points in the self-defense items category wins the game. Or, if this is all just a test and nothing happens whatsoever, the person with the most points in luxury items wins the game. So let's talk about how those games are going to end. Each round in this game takes place over three phases. First, you have the panic phase. Second, you have the negotiations phase. And third, you have the scramble phase. Each phase has a leader, which at the beginning of the game is determined either randomly or it has certain conditions like youngest, oldest, and most likely to survive an apocalyptic event. As the game progresses, however, depending on what items you acquire throughout the game, these leaders can change, and there are some pretty big benefits to being the leader of a phase. So let's talk about how the rounds go. In the panic phase, the first thing that happens every round is a new panic card is revealed. Something to note, this game takes place over, at the very least, four rounds. It could end as early as round five, or go as far as round nine. The panic phase leader is going to flip over a card. Now, in the first four rounds, it's always going to be a card that says DEFCON. It's going to be either DEFCON 1 through 4. That just says that the panic level is increasing, different things are going to be happening. But depending on the level, is how far you can move family members down on items that you've acquired throughout the game. So when I first start on working on an item, so let's say I have these cans of peanut butter, it starts on the start space, and this card says DEFCON 1. Everybody would move each family member they have one space down on each item that they have. Once you've reached the check mark, you have acquired that item. That family member is again available to use. And this goes into your provisions pile, which means it's available for you to score victory points, uh, as well as win control of one of these leader cards. During this panic phase, once we hit round five, if one of two cards comes out, which is either the bomb drops or the Russians invade, the game will end immediately with one of those conditions. Now, there are a lot of ways to be able to manipulate this, but I'll talk about that a little bit later because it happens in the negotiations phase. After everybody has moved down their family members on their tracks, we are going to reveal an event card. These event cards have varying effects that can go anywhere from moving down further on item tracks or... Uh, setting aside family members to gain additional benefits, uh, voting on certain things, um, or even acquiring equipment items. So there are a lot of things that could happen with the events, but generally, if you are the leader of the panic phase, you are going to have an additional benefit that other people do not. Not on every event card, but on a lot of them. Then we move on to the negotiations phase. So everybody will have a handful of supply cards. Everybody is going to choose a, hand, a card from their hand of supply cards and hand it to the negotiations phase leader. In addition, a random card will be drawn from the top of the deck, and they are going to be placed out for everybody to see, like so. And then we are going to bid. So you are going to be trying to acquire new cards, which are going to give you the victory points, depending on the victory condition that you want to have happen. But also, you can bid your family members on these spaces in the city hall. The city hall is how you affect these tracks. The negotiations phase leader is going to choose whether they want to bid first or last. Everybody, one by one, is going to take one of their family members and they're going to place it on either one of these items or on one of these city spaces. And we go around and around until everybody has played every single one of their family members. If you have more family members on a certain card than any other player, 
you acquire that card, you get to put it in your shopping pile, which means you're working on it, and you place your family member on the start space. And that is where you're going to move down that track due to the DEF CON level uh, to see whether you acquire that item or how long it takes you to acquire it. In the city spaces, if you gain the most in the city space, you're going to be able to resolve a special ability. If there is ever a tie for either a card or a city space, nobody gets it. On a tie, everybody loses. You just return your family members and the card goes away. In the city hall, then the negotiations phase leader once again decides whether they want to go first or last. An order in this aspect is extremely important. So the mayor's office, what the mayor's office allows you to do is either to add or remove a card from one of these panic stacks. Now we're going to have a pile of cards on the atomic bomb drops deck and on the Russians invade deck. Now at the very beginning of the game, the bomb will start somewhere in here and the Russians invade will start somewhere in here. At the beginning of the game, cards are dealt out, so it is possible that we start the game with one of those cards out here. But the mayor's office allows you either to remove the card and place it back on one of these decks, or to add a card from one of those decks to one of these piles. So that's where, let's say, you wanted to be able to have the bomb drop. So in my last game that I played, I wanted the bomb to drop. I knew the bomb was on top of the Russians invade deck. I moved it over and placed it in a stack so that if it weren't going to be manipulated in the future, the bomb was going to drop. In the sheriff's office, the Sheriff's Office allows you to pick up an entire pile of panic cards and look at them, and then you can rearrange them however you would like. Now, that's key because if I had just gone through and added that bomb there and you wanted to see what I added, you can go and look at it and say, oh crap, Sam added the bomb, I need to be either stacking up those consumable items, or if I don't think that I have more than anybody else of those, I need to somehow figure a way to get that bomb out of there because if it drops, I'm not going to win. The other option is the Civil Defense Orders. Civil Defense Orders is how you manipulate these two decks over here. So that allows you to draw two cards in whatever order you want. You can either draw two from the Russian Invade, two from the Atomic Bomb, or one from each. And then you can actually place those cards however you would like on the top or bottom of either deck. So even though at the very beginning of the game, the bomb will start in the bomb deck and the Russians Invade will start in that other deck, they could swap mid-game. So you don't always know when you're pulling a card with the mayor's office and putting it from the Russians invade pile into one of these panic card piles, whether it's actually going to be the Russians invade card or could be the atomic bomb card, or more than likely, it's just a DEFCON card. At the end of the negotiations phase, we move to the last phase of the game, which is the scramble phase. In the scramble phase, everybody has the option, first of all, to buy equipment cards, which is where you can spend luxury items that you have already acquired and you can buy these. Generally, these are just going to have special abilities that help affect your outcome um, throughout the game, either letting you win ties or looking at cards or manipulating things. Uh, they have a lot of varied abilities, and it'll tell you right on the card what you do. Then we have the option to stockpile. Stockpiling is important. How I talked about the game has three end conditions, and these cards tell you how many points you have for that end condition. So if this is sitting in my provisions pile at the end of the game, it is worth 50 self-defense points. So if it ends with the Russians invading, this will score me 50 points. However, if I choose to stockpile it, which is where I move it and I turn it face down and put it in my stockpile, it is double the points. So it goes from 50 self-defense points to 100, which is huge. That plays a big factor. But there is a downside. I talked about how it's powerful to be the leader of a phase. After we stockpile, you actually are going to, we're going to go around and see who has the most in each category. Whoever has the most in each category is going to become the leader of that phase. So the panic phase is the person who has the most consumable items. You can tell that because he's red and the consumables are red. Negotiations phase is going to be the person with the most self-defense items. Self-defense items are blue. This guy's blue. See how that works? The last one is the scramble phase, person with most luxury items is able to gain this and is the leader for that phase. Then everybody is going to draw back up to their hand of four supply cards and we do it all over again until we hit one of the three outcomes. If the bomb drops or if the Russians invade, it can happen anywhere around five to nine. 
However, if we reveal the last panic card in round nine and neither of those two things have happened, then the game ends with it only being a test and whoever has the most luxury items wins. All right, so now I've told you a little bit about how to play. Let me talk about the game a little bit and my thoughts on it. So I love the mind games aspect in this. So when you're moving cards from provision pile to stockpile, you can play a mind game with someone and start moving over a bunch of items. So all of a sudden they're like, oh, geez, does he know something that I don't? Is the game going to end next round? Do I need to stockpile everything? And we had that happen. One guy just decided to move everything to a stockpile. We didn't know if he had hidden information. So we go around and the rest of us all stockpile, except for the last guy, because he had just looked at the piles and he knew the game wasn't going to end. So then all of a sudden he was the leader of all three phases because he had all of his items out and we had trashed him. The mind game aspect was really, really cool. These event cards are fun. Uh, for the panic phase leader, they can just affect how the game is going to go, affect how it's played. I really like the event cards as well. The way that this these decks are manipulated, I'm a fan of. Um, because even though it starts off with, yes, this is the bomb pile, this is the Russians invade pile, you can totally mess it up. So in my first game, I used the civil defense orders. I pulled the top card of the bomb deck, and the bomb was right there. And so I said, it was in like the first round or something, I said, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and eliminate that option from the table, and I'm going to collect as many luxury items as possible and hope the Russians don't invade. And I took that and I put it on the bottom of the Russians invade deck. And the bomb never came out. Now, it can come out if p enough people are manipulating those decks and pulling those cards. But it was unlikely that that was going to happen. I enjoy that. I, I think it's really fun to be able to have hidden information that you know that other people don't. But this, it didn't feel... The, the game itself didn't feel so like screw with your mind enough that it wasn't enjoyable for me because when when I play some hidden information games um I dislike a lot of times when it's like well you did this in round four when this person did this and that person did this and because of that I'm going to surmise that this happened over here I don't like that I don't I'm not a big fan of like the social deduction games this type of deduction game though is very fun because it has very little to do with human behavior I mean, a little bit, but more of like tactical. I saw that him put this over here and I saw that that was moved over there. What is that? What is going on there? Rather than like you blinked in the wrong way. So I think that you're lying. I don't like those types of games. So this does the whole deception um, and kind of deduction portion in a way that I really enjoy. I, a couple of things that I did not like about the game. These equipment cards. Um, in, in every game that I've played, everybody has kind of agreed they do cool things and they can have good effects for you, but most of the time I just find that they're not worth it. You know, you spend a lot of time acquiring these items, and especially luxury items, um, and just spending those luxury items to gain these equipment cards, I found is not worth it to me. Or at least if I'm playing the strategy right, it hasn't been worth it to me. And most everybody has felt that way. In each game that I've played, I think maybe one luxury or one of these equipment cards was purchased through the entire game, and that's it. Um, in each game, one was purchased. People just found that it wasn't worth it to them. So I, I'm not a big fan of these equipment cards. I think that they would need to be adjusted, or or there's something about them that, that need to make them more worthwhile. Um, this is obviously a prototype copy, and so don't judge any of the artwork or the graphic design or anything. All of that is subject to change. This is just a prototype copy for the Kickstarter. Um, overall, though, I'm a big fan of the game. Uh, the gameplay is pretty smooth. Uh, the game does not take too long. I think most of my games have been an hour, you know, maybe an hour and a half. Uh, and it doesn't take up too much space on your table. It's fairly simple to explain when you're explaining, to, explaining it to players. I... You know, honestly, I'm a fan of it. Um, it it kind of hits a couple of, of pieces for me that I don't see a lot of other games hit. Um, and, and it is something that I would back. Absolutely. I, it's It does some unique things that I enjoy. So based off of that, if this is something that looks interesting to you, head over to the Kickstarter page, check it out, see if it's something that you would like. Obviously, I enjoy it. Um, and if you like kind of these, uh, you know, hidden information, deception style games where you're
deducing what things are happening, uh, this might be the game for you. So thank you for watching. If you like the video, please hit the subscribe button, uh, hit the like, leave me a comment, let me know what you think. Uh, do you agree with what I say? Do you not agree? What do you think about the game? Uh, let me know. I'm Sam. This is Sam Says. I hope you have a fantastic day and game on.